I'm Dr. Jeremy Stovall. Today we're going to be learning about regeneration surveys. Uh, this is part of a lab for Forestry 3347 at Stephen F. Austin State University in the Arthur Temple College of Forestry and Agriculture. During a typical semester when we haven't been moved online, this lab would be conducted along the Angelina River bottom in a couple different hardwood stands. Today we'll discuss three different regeneration survey methodologies, stock quadrat plots, a couple different options to use in planted stands, and finally a system designed for bottomland hardwoods for red oak and ash by Balai et al. Today we're discussing regeneration surveys. Uh, we're here near Boykin Springs in Deep East Texas in a longleaf pine forest. Right beside me we have a small longleaf pine seedling. And so with regeneration surveys, you're going to use them a number of different times uh, within a rotation. You may use them prior to a harvest to determine if you have enough regeneration potential, seedlings like this possibly, that you would release if you remove the overstory in a clear cut. Uh, you may use a regeneration survey to determine if you have enough advanced regeneration, again seedlings there before the harvest, to do an establishment cut or a seed tree cut if you're using even age silviculture but are removing part of the overstory first to grow that lower cohort or help establish that lower cohort that will become your future stand. Finally, you might do a regeneration survey after a harvest operation or even after planting trees uh, in an attempt to determine if your regeneration method was actually successful or whether it failed. Regeneration surveys may be necessary for a variety of different reasons. If regeneration is unsuccessful, that may be information that you need to go and interplant or even completely replant that forest. If you are certified or have some sort of certification for your forest, uh, you may need a regeneration survey to document that your regeneration methods were successful. Uh, you may also need regeneration surveys in order to help you predict how that stand will go in the future by knowing how many trees per acre that you are starting with. There are two things we can look at with regeneration surveys. We can look at them on a stocking basis, how many trees per acre we have, or we can look at them on a percentage basis. So if you've planted 500 pine trees per acre or hardwood trees per acre, you can go count and find out what your percent mortality is and what your percent survival is. That percent survival is going to be a lot more difficult to obtain on a naturally regenerated stand because you may not have data on how many trees actually established and how many have died versus how many have survived. One simple method to use for a regeneration survey that applies to any species, any cover type, or any desired stocking level will be a stock quadrat approach. And the stock quadrat is extremely simple. You need to know how many trees per acre that you want. So for longleaf, if we think that we want 300 per acre or 500 per acre, we need to make that determination in advance. If we wanted 500 longleaf pines per acre to determine that our regeneration attempt was successful, all we then do is figure out the radius of a circular plot that is one five hundredth of an acre. And so you can use simple equipment like a logger's tape and once you know that radius you'll be able to go out and assess your different plots. Right now we're going to calculate the radius of a plot if we know the acreage. Uh, so let's start with the fact that we know there are 43,560 square feet per one acre. Okay, so I just mentioned a one five hundredth acre plot is what we want to look at. So this is pretty straightforward. If I take 43,560 and I divide it by 500, that's going to equal the area of the plot in square feet. And it's because we knew that it was a 500th of an acre plot. We knew there were 43,560 square feet in an acre. And so the units cancel out to the point that we get one plot uh, per so many square feet. 
okay? Um, and so that's the first step to learn your area. And then once you learn your area, in this case, I know area equals uh, 87 point, there we go, let me get it for you in Zoom here. There we go, 87.12 square feet for a 500 acre plot. Um, so now what we need after this is our formula for a circle. Area equals uh, pi r squared. So let me do it like you would code it into Excel. So the pi with the open and close parentheses is how Excel accepts 3.14159, et cetera, times the radius uh, squared, okay? And so when I want to start solving this equation algebraically, I know pi, it's a constant. I know area, 87.12 square feet in this example. So I want to calculate r. So the first thing I need to do is put r on its own side of the equation. So I'll divide both sides of this equation by pi. So I have area over pi equals r squared. Okay, so now I need to get r by itself without it being squared. So what I'll do is I'll take the square root of both sides of the equation. So I'm gonna put brackets in here, area over pi, and I don't have a handy square root symbol on here. So let me just raise this to the 0.5 power. Raising something to the half power is the same as taking the square root of it. Uh, we've gone over that earlier this semester already, equals r. Well, now I have my equation. And so when I put all this together, let me just copy it for you here and show you what it would look like for your calculator. You can, of course, use the pi button, this pi function in Excel, but I have my 87.12, or you can just enter it manually, equals 3.14159265, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'll do this math first. And when I do that, I get 27.73, if I'm doing this on a calculator. And then I take the square root of 27.73, and that equals 5.266, if I do this very precisely. Here's the thing, though. You're measuring this out on a logger's tape in the woods. So do you think you can be precise to the thousandth of an inch or the thousandth of a foot? Absolutely not. We may be able to do a hundredth of a foot, that's stretching. Really a tenth of a foot is all we really need. So for the purposes of a stop quadrat plot, if you just went through there and did 5.3 feet, that's gonna be pretty darn close. That's not gonna introduce uh, any more error than you're gonna do just by missing a seedling here or there, uh, something along those lines. And so now we have the radius of our plot for a 500 acre, it equals 5.3 feet. So remember that is a radius, that is not a diameter. And so if you want to go and actually put this plot in there, here's our circular plot. And just remember that the radius is only half of it, okay? So it's actually gonna be 10.6 feet, or if we wanna be more precise, 10.5 feet all the way across in diameter, because the diameter is two radii. Once you know the radius of your plot, a very simple way to implement a stock quadrat is to find a stick on your site, measure and break it to the radius of your plot. Then you can use this simple stick as a measurement device. If you decide your plot center is here, you can set up your plot systematically where you're walking so many chains on a grid, creating that grid and putting a plot in at each grid point, or you could distribute them randomly using GIS software. But once you locate one of your plots, you simply put your stick at plot center, you rotate it completely around to form that circle. Here's where stock quadrat is very simple. If I determine that this is a free to grow seedling of a desirable species in my plot, that plot is stocked, you check mark it, okay? So the plot is stocked or not stocked. I have one longleaf pine seedling in here, that makes this plot stocked. If I had dozens right here, the plot would still be stocked. If this is my plot center for another plot right here, I use my handy stick again, I look at the full radius of my plot, and as I look throughout that entire circular plot, I'm not seeing any longleaf pine seedlings. For species like longleaf, you may need to be careful. It has a grass stage. It can be very difficult to observe, but if you know what to look for and you've defined what that free-to-grow seedling is, I'm not seeing one here. This plot is unstocked.
One more thing that we need to know when we're doing any regeneration survey is what a free-to-grow seedling is. Okay? So a free-to-grow seedling is a tree that can make it into a dominant or codominant crown position in your stand, depending on what your management regime is going to be. So a seedling that's overtopped by higher competing vegetation or that's very close to a large tree that you don't plan to remove in future harvests would not be considered a free-to-grow seedling. You also need to know what species are desirable in your stand. So if you've planted trees, you know what species those are. Those are your desirable species. In natural regeneration, you need to make a list of the species that you want based on your management objective. In a stand like this, we may just want longleaf pine, so we might have one species on our list. If you're managing a bottomland hardwood stand, you might have dozens of species on your list that you find desirable to meet your management objective. Sometimes we may consider saplings, trees in the sapling size class, even larger than seedlings, but smaller than pulpwood. We may consider those in a regeneration survey, even trees up to four or five inches in diameter at breast height. Uh, there are other considerations there. For example, if you're managing for timber in this longleaf pine stand, the sweep we're seeing on this uh, would cause you to discount it as regeneration. This isn't a tree that's ever going to make a good dominant or codominant tree, so there's no reason to count this as a free-to-grow seedling. You might have seedlings of other species like this sweet gum here. If this sweet gum is undesirable for our management objective, as it may be in this longleaf pine forest, we're not going to count it. It's not the right species. However, if you have a nicely formed sapling, like this longleaf pine here, that may be a tree that you count in a regeneration survey, even though it's not a small seedling, it's much larger. Some trees of some species, now longleaf pine does not sprout, but many hardwood trees will re-sprout from the stump, so you may actually count on that as a major source of advanced regeneration in a stand, where if you cut the tree, the sprouts will come out, and that's going to be your next dominant or codominant tree. So in some cases, you're actually counting on the stump or even the root sprouting potential in species like aspen for your regeneration in the next stand. And so you go and you do all your different plots, and by the time you get to the end of your survey, you just divide the total number of stock plots like this one by total plots and you get a percentage. If 85 or 90% of your plots were stocked, you may not have any problem with regeneration. That's a good indication if you've done a systematic grid that you probably have regeneration well distributed throughout your site. There are two downsides to this approach. One, you don't get stocking. We have no idea how many trees per acre we have out here because I counted this plot stocked with this one longleaf pine and I may have counted another one right over there as stocked if it had 20 longleaf in it. We have no idea how many trees per acre we have in the younger cohort. The other disadvantage is if all you're using is that percent number, you have no idea where they are. So if I tell you that this stand is 85% stocked with longleaf pine regeneration, that sounds good. But what happens if 85% of my area on one side of the stand is well stocked, almost 100% stocked, but I have this corner where regeneration failed? Maybe different soil conditions, different light conditions, something different over there. Well, then I don't know that I do have 15% area of my stand in one general location that may be understocked where I would have an opportunity to interplant or replant that uh, potentially to fix this problem with regeneration. There's a simple fix for that second problem. All you need to do uh, is bring a map with you. Uh, this could be in digital form on a tablet. This could be an old fashioned paper map. And you simply mark which plots are stocked and which aren't on that map. And at the end of your survey, you'll be very easily able to look at this map and you'll be able to see, oh, this is the area where I have unstocked plots, that area may need further attention. So you can see a major advantage to the stock plot approach is that it is very quick. You spend more time walking between plots than you actually spend in plots collecting data because it's either yes they're stocked or no they are not. It's a very quick approach to use, unless of course you have a very thick site that's difficult to move through and then any survey method you're going to use is going to be difficult. In the first year or two after planting a pine plantation, you may want to go through and do a regeneration survey so you can see if you need to interplant that stand. 
These trees honestly might be a little too big by this point. It appears they're in about their third year. Uh, if you interplanted seedlings in and amongst these, you can see they would probably get outcompeted by these older trees, so you might be wasting money. But if you had smaller, younger pines, first year or two post-planting, you do have an opportunity to interplant. Of course, if you got much more substantial mortality, you know, then you might need to replant the whole stand, even if you didn't catch it until two or three years following the initial planting. Now, the advantage of doing a regeneration survey in a pine plantation, uh, you could do stock quadrat that we've just gone over already. That works in natural stands or planted stands. But the advantage you have here is I can see the tree rows. They planted them right down this way. And so I know about the spacing they're supposed to have planted them at, and I can go through and I can count on that spacing. I can pick a 50 tree interval, or I can pick 100 trees, whatever I want, and I can go count how many are there, how many are missing, and very quickly get an estimate of percent survival. Then I can go pick a row somewhere else in the stand and get random locations with some simple little row plots that'll give me a good indication of survival. Of course, in a pine plantation, the other thing you may run into, you may not want percent survival. Sometimes if we have an adjacent pine stand over here that's mature, it may be blowing seed in. We may get a lot of volunteer seedlings. And at that point, you may want to put in some fixed area plots, count your trees, and in doing that, you can determine how many tree breaker you actually have on the site. You may have too many volunteer pines, and if you have too many, say more than 800, you may consider coming out and doing a pre-commercial thin to drop your planting density or your current density back to closer what you intended to as a planting density. We're here in a bottomland hardwood stand. Uh, we're in a back slough off of the Atoyak Bayou here in Deep East Texas. And so this is an example of a stand where you could use the Belay et al regeneration survey method. So this is a regeneration survey method that's been parameterized specifically for red oaks and ash, which are some of our higher timber value species in our southern bottomlands. That being said, you may not want to manage for ash anymore uh, since the emerald ash borer is extirpating it across much of its native range. Uh, many folks managing hardwood ecosystems are now simply removing ash while they can uh, before the insect comes in and kills it. Uh, but it still works well for red oak. Um, and when I say red oak, I'm not speaking of southern red oak, Quercus falcata specifically. We're talking about red oak group oaks. So I have a small willow oak right here beside me, Quercus fellows. Um, it'll have the on, the little bristle sticking out the tip of each lobe. And that's how you morphologically tell that you have an oak that is in the red oak group. So this system will apply for willow oak, water oak, laurel oak, which are some of our most common bottomland oaks in the southern coastal plain. And it also applies to higher value species that we would like to manage, like cherry bark oak, nutall oak, uh, schumard oak, and others. Uh, this was designed for minor bottoms in Mississippi. We can apply it here in East Texas. It may be a little inaccurate because we're at the fringe of the range of many of these species but uh, it's the, one of the best tools that we've got for this approach. You set up a one hundredth of an acre circular plot for this system. I'll let you calculate the radius on that. And in that one hundredth acre plot, what you're gonna do is you're gonna survey uh, everything in that plot and you're gonna tally red oaks and ash species by size. Within your hundredth uh, acre plot, what you're gonna do is tally seedlings uh, by size class. Our smallest size class is trees less than a foot tall, so very small seedlings. Then we move up to trees between one foot tall and three feet tall, slightly larger seedlings. The next size class is trees that are between three feet in height and one inch in diameter at breast height. And that doesn't make sense at first, right? How can you sample a tree? where it's got this category that's made up of both a diameter and a height. Uh, but when we look at how you do that, so say I had a tree that was only three feet tall. Well, I measure DBH at four and a half feet. That tree would not have a DBH yet because it's not four and a half feet tall. As it grows taller, 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 it eventually ends up having a DBH. 
And once it gets tall enough, like this tree, we don't want to bother measuring the height anymore. I don't want to carry a height pole around down here and estimate height on lots of these trees on a stand. So now I just measure DBH. It's right here. It's accessible. It's easy. And eventually a tree will get up to a DBH of one inch. So that's how greater than three feet but less than one inch DBH makes sense as a discrete size class. This uh, willow oak here is clearly in the one to five inch DBH category. Looks like it's about three and a half inches in DBH. So that's where we would tallow this as a red oak, one to five inches DBH. Um, this tree, you may cut down in that logging operation potentially, but you would anticipate an oak this young and small in diameter to have a high probability to stump sprout. Because of its small size, it probably wouldn't get too many sprouts. So they would probably have decent form uh, as a co-dominant and dominant tree later in that rotation. And the advantage and growth rate of having the root system of this larger tree to start with. So that would give them a competitive advantage. This is one of those small ash trees that would be in the greater than three feet tall, but less than one inch in DBH category. So that's where you would score this if it were in our hundredth acre plot. This is an example of how you would measure one of these hundredth acre plots. I'm standing in the middle one that I have measured out right here. Um, and so right off the bat, I have an ash tree. And so I'm gonna score this as slightly more than one inch DBH. So it's gonna go in our one to five inch DBH category right here. So this has a lot of regeneration potential for this plot if you're counting ash. Your dendro skills have to be pretty good to do this. Cause I look at this tree, uh, many students I've seen in dendro can easily mistake this for an ash if you're not paying attention to opposite or alternate. This is pinnately compound. It's alternate, however. It has serrated leaf margins. This is a hickory. So this isn't gonna to count towards our tally because remember this system works solely for red oak and ash. Now as I look around, in this back slough I can see a lot of damage that hogs have done. That's probably disturbed some of the seedlings I might otherwise find here. Uh, this is being filmed in April 2020. We've had a pretty wet winter in East Texas. So this back slough definitely takes on some water over winter. I'm standing in some pretty thick mud right now. Um, but as I look around, I'm seeing a lot of grass. I'm seeing a lot of poison ivy. Uh, but honestly, I'm not seeing any small tree seedlings uh, of really any species. There's some rubus in here, some blackberry. Um, but, you know, no real small tree seedlings. That makes my job easy for this system. If I had dozens of little seedlings of red oak and ash species, you're going to be counting them uh, for this system. Now, while you're counting them, once you have enough points, you know, looking at, at your tally sheet, that you're going to be over 95% stocking for that plot. If you need the data for something else, you could continue counting seedlings. But once you realize the plot has a greater than 95% probability of being stocked, if you don't need that data, that, that may be all you need to know. You can move along to the next plot, save yourself a little bit of time. I've got another tree back in here that would be in my one to five inch size class, uh, which is in my plot, but it's another hickory. Uh, so again, you have to be able to tell ash apart from hickory. You need to be able to tell your red oaks apart from your white oaks and other species that may appear similar to them. So uh, that's how this plot would score out. Now let me score it out for you on the sheet so you can see how that works. All right, here is our tally sheet for the Belay et al. method. And so uh, you can see a column right here for our counts. The easiest way to tally counts in there, remember, is going to be our dot box tally system, where the first four trees you tally are dots in the corners of a box. The next four are lines creating the side of the box. And then the final two are lines creating an X in the middle of the box. You can see spaces a little tight, so that'll help you get all your trees in there. Okay, so let's look at the scenario, the plot that we just broke down in the field. And so what we saw is we had a single ash. So you can see right here are my ash. This top box up here is for red oaks. Uh, they're similar in a lot of regards. They each have our three size classes, less than a foot, one to three feet, greater than three feet to one inch DBH. We went over that a couple times and then one to five inches. And so what we observed on that plot out uh, near uh, the Alazan Bayou was a single ash in our plot greater than three feet 
uh, but less than one inch DBH. So let me put a tally mark there. Okay, so that was the only tree. This one's gonna be easy to work up. My count was one. Each of these ash trees is worth 12 points. So that gives me 12 total points here. Okay, I'm gonna switch over to the text box. That may work a little easier. So our total red oak points for the whole plot, zero. We didn't observe any. Our total ash points off that one tree, 12. We only saw the one tree, it had 12 points. Total red oak and ash points for the whole plot, well, it was just that one ash tree that gave us 12 points. Probability of red oak stocking. What I do now is I look at this table on my right and you add up your total points and get to your probability. Well, if you have zero, we can just go ahead and put in zero. It's not even on the table, but there you go. Probability of ash stocking. Let me look up 12. And I can see with that single ash tree in my plot, it yielded a 65% probability of ash stocking. Finally, I want the probability of either red oak or ash stocking. And so what I need to do there, I don't want to sum the zero and the 65. In this particular case, it comes out the same. Uh, but say, for example, I had uh, a little bit different scenario here. Let's pretend instead I also had one point uh, for oak. So let's say I got a count of one of these little oak seedlings. I had one oak seedling less than a foot in the plot. That would have given me one total point. So here I would have got instead of zero there, I would have ended up with one point. Let me change that to one for us. And then my points here in total would have been 13, not 12 for all of them. Well, if I do that, then my probability of red oak stocking becomes 8%. I can look up that one point is worth 8%. So here's where you go wrong with that. Eight plus 65 would make me think that I needed to just add those together. And down here, I would put in 73. Eight plus 65 equals 73. I put that right there for either red oak or ash stocking. However, what I need to do is look at the points, 13. I look up 13 right here on my table, and it's not 73, it's 68. So I would have overestimated that by about 5%. Now, is that 5% meaningful when you're taking hardwood seedlings and projecting their growth 10 or 20 years into the future? There's gonna be a lot of error around that, but we'll still do the best that we can. Okay, uh, so let's look at a few other possible scenarios you might run into on uh, this, tool. And so let me erase some of the stuff I've put on here for us. Um, so from a practical standpoint, when you get to 35 points, we can see even 34. We're at 95% probability of that plot stocking, meaning that plot eventually produces codominant dominant trees of red oaks or ash. That's plenty good. That's, you know, nothing's really 95% in forestry, right? Uh, that's, that's more certainty than we can really expect in the real world. So if you end up with 60 points, 70 points, let's just call it 95%. That's good, a good enough estimate. So as you're in the field doing this, if you start, you know, tallying up seedlings and you see, hey, I've got four ash trees that are in the one to three foot size class, you're done. You know it's 95%. You don't have to worry about everything else unless you want that data for some other purpose. Um, here, let's, let's do another example for you. And let's say we got two seedlings here. Let's go with three seedlings here. Um, and so I had a count of two in the one to three foot class. Let me, let me add in one more here for the count. Let's say we got this one little oak seedling, less than a foot tall. So let me work this up for you as an example. Here's, uh, so I type three, that should be one. Let me fix that. Um, so I had one seedling times one point per seedling. That gave me one total point. Now I have two of these seedlings in the one to three foot class, three and a half points each. And so two times three and a half is going to give me seven. And so I'll enter that there. You could put zeros in here if you want. I'm just going to leave them blank. And so now I add up my total points here and I arrive at eight for the red oaks. Let's go down here to ash. Three seedlings less than one foot tall, one point apiece. That easily gives me three points. Total points for ash, three. Okay, so that's pretty easy. Now total red oak and ash points, I'm gonna add my three and my eight up. So I just add up all the total points off the whole diagram, but I've already done subtotals, so I'll just use those, make it easy. So I'm sitting there looking at 11. 
Now let me look up the probability of red oak stocking. I have eight red oak points right here in this row on our table. That's 50%. Let me look at ash, three total points. That's 23%. So again, remember, don't just add the 50 and the 23 and assume that it's 73% probability of stocking either. Instead, I'm going to look up 11, 62%. And so there I've worked this up. So then you can start making decisions on that. Is 62% good enough that you'd be willing to do, um, say, an establishment cut in a shelter wood? And that's a little bit where the art of silviculture starts coming in. You have to look at what's going on across all your plots on the landscape. Um, one more scenario you could run into that I haven't really gone over here. Let's say you end up with 17 and a half points. So let me circle that right here. So. 17 and a half points is halfway between 17 and 18. It's possible to get that because you can see some of these end in a 0.5. And so we could linearly interpolate. Basically, 17 to 18 goes from 77 to 79%. We could just call that 78% because it is halfway in between. And that's how you use the data sheet for the Bly et al. Uh, stocking method uh, for minor river bottoms in Mississippi but we'll apply this here in East Texas. Thanks for watching the SFA Silviculture Regeneration Survey Lab. We went over regeneration surveys in general and then looked at three specific methodologies, the stock quadrat approach, some suggestions for pine plantations and other plantations, and finally the Bly et al. method appropriate for bottomland hardwoods in the U.S. South. If you'd like a hard copy of documents related to this lab, please Google SFA Silviculture.